I'd like to share with you that uh, the scripture this morning uh, that, that uh, we'll be looking at together here in just a moment, um, this started off in my heart a little while back, and uh, it was actually before the new church year uh, took place, and uh, the nominating committee was busy getting all of its stuff together and uh, making its phone calls and, and asking folks to serve and, uh, and all of those things. And I was really worried because I, I came across this passage and I started looking at it. And uh, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's First Chronicles uh, chapter 27, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do. You'll find your way over there. First Chronicles chapter 27, and starting in verse 25 and going to verse 34. So when you open that up and you start to look at it and you start to see some of the words here, I was thinking like, well, how in the world, uh, I, I just won't be able to preach from this scripture because I'll just never be able to get through that without stumbling and messing up. And, uh, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm really thinking, though, you know, God's really convicted my heart that this is the passage that, that, I, need to, that I need to use. And about this time, uh, it was on a Sunday morning, actually, uh, uh, that Rick came and he said he wanted to share his a testimony, a witness about something that had happened in his family with his son. Y'all remember that? Several, it's been several weeks ago. And, and Rick shared that, and I had this, I had this message then, and and I folded it up and I put it away. Well, another part of that story is, so uh, I guess earlier that week, uh, I had been visiting with Terry and Sherry at the hospital at Duke. And uh, man, I was really struggling with this, with this particular passage. And Sherry was struggling also at the time. And uh, I remember sitting there with her and uh, sitting in, uh, in a chair, and she was holding my hand, and we were just talking a little bit, and I said, you know, I got this passage of Scripture that I really want to share, but I said, I really am afraid that I won't do very good trying to read it because I, I'm afraid I'll stumble around my words and I won't pronounce it correctly. And, uh, and I kind of thought as I was there, I said, well, you know, Sherry, if, if you can do all of what you're doing. If you're brave enough to let them do the things they're doing to you to help you and, and to go through the things that you're going through, certainly I can be brave enough to attempt to, to read uh, this scripture and get it right. And she kind of smiled and she said, yes. Yeah. She said, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do it. So uh, I came Sunday morning all prepared uh, to do, uh, to read this scripture, First Chronicles chapter 27. And then Rick came forward and said, you know, I really got something I'd like to share if it's okay. And I thought, okay, that's great. And because uh, and, I was thinking, man, I'm off the hook. I don't have to, I don't have to share that scripture, but the Lord just kind of wouldn't let me uh, let that go. And so this morning, uh, with the Lord's help, I want to share this scripture and some thoughts from this scripture. So again, First Chronicles chapter 27, starting in verse 25 and going to verse 34. And it says, And as Maveth, the son of Adel, was over the king's treasure, and Jonathan, the son of Uzziah, was over the storehouses in the field, in the cities, in the villages, and in the fortresses. Ezrai, the son of Caleb, was over those who did the work of the field for the tilling of the ground. And Shemai the Ramathite, was over the vineyards. And Zabdi, the shipmite, was over the produce of the vineyard for the supply of wine. And Belhanna, the Gitterite, was over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the lowlands. And Joash was over the storehouse of oil. And Shittri, the Sharonite, was over the herds that fed in Sharon. 
And Shaphat, the son of Adlai, was over the herds that were in the valleys. Obil, the Ishlamite, was over the camels. And Jehiadai, the Moronite, was over the donkeys. And Jaziz, the Hagrite, was over the flocks. And all these were the officials over King David's property. Verse 32 says, Also Jonathan, David's uncle, was a counselor, a wise man, and a scribe. And Jehiel, the son of Hakmoni, was with the king's son. And Athaphil, and Athaphil was the king's counselor. And Hushai, the archite, was the king's companion. And after Ahithophel was Jehoiada, the son of Benani, then Abitar, and the general of the king's army was Joab. Would, would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you this morning to, Lord, to just uh, look over us this morning, Lord, to allow the Holy Spirit to work and move here in this place to go down each and every aisle and touch each and every heart. And Father, just to open our hearts and our minds, for Lord, that we might see every thought and every word uh, every comma, every period, every idea, Lord, that you have in your scripture this morning. Father, I ask that you would bind Satan, set him outside this place. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of speech, Lord, that your word would go out unhindered from this place. And Father, I ask now that you would have your way with us here, now, in this place. And Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm also thankful that he did allow me to mostly get through that and not mess up too bad. But, uh, you know, something else that I, I realized, so, so I, I came back and, and you know, there's, there's, all kind of, there's all kind of help tools out there now, right? So I, 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 I fired up my audio Bible, and, and it's got all kind of, you know, it's got the King James and the NIV, and, the, and, it, and it'll read it, it'll read it to you. So one of the things I realized, though, is I was listening to different people read it. You could hear it read dramatically or just just red plain or whatever. But but every one of them that I listened to said those words I just said a different way than I just said them. So I figured, well, it must be okay, right? <clears throat> but uh, you know, and, and I guess too, I'd like to just say that, you know, the reason the, I guess the reason I'm nervous about that and, and, and you know, I just have such a desire in my heart to get it right. I just want it to be right. Every word Every comma, every period, every dot, every pause. I, 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 just want it to, I just want it to be right. I want it to glorify the Lord. So, that, that, that is my nervousness in this. Now, my thoughts for getting to this passage was, again, I shared with you that, that um, it was before the new church year and, and, and the uh, uh, nominating committee was all busy working and doing its thing and calling people and and, uh, and, and getting ready for the new church year for people to serve in these places. Well, here this morning, we have in these verses are listed the officers who served in King David's uh, court along uh, with the duties and responsibilities that they had to carry out. Now, you know, it must have been a great honor in that day for to be chosen to serve in the king's court, to, to do business for the king, to be placed in his service. Could you imagine today, maybe for us, it would be kind of, um, it would kind of be like uh, uh, if you could imagine if the president of the United States were to, to call and ask you to fill a spot in his cabinet to be part of his administration. And, and by the way, I I know there's a lot of there's a lot of jokes and and, and and things, and this is a critical time for our country. And I just said, I said, wouldn't it be it would be an honor, be be like getting a call from the president of the United States. Folks, we need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our president. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things going on. And, and he's a man, just like anybody else. I'm not saying he's right or he's wrong, and I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm just talking about prayer. All right? That we need to lift up our president, our vice president, our congressmen, our senators, our judges, every part of our government today. We need to lift that up in prayer. We need to... We need to ask God to bring them to a place that, uh, that they don't seek man 
uh, manly counsel, but that they would seek godly counsel in the decisions and the things that they make. And I won't say anything about it. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time, but, but we, need to, we need to do that. We need to lift our president up in prayer. So, again, imagine if the president called and asked you to fill a spot in his cabinet. Most folks would consider that to be a great honor, right? But have you ever considered that the Lord, the Lord calls out men and women, ordinary, regular men and women every day to serve Him? As a matter of fact, He gives every believer a place of service in the body of Christ. If, if you're born again, if you're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus, if you're saved, if you're part of the body of Christ, there's a place for you to serve. Now, uh, we have to have a little due diligence there. We have to be in God's Word. We have to be praying. We have to be talking with the Lord and asking Him where He would have us to serve at. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every believer, we have a place in the body of Christ. We have a, a service, a job, a, a, a place to work. What a blessing to be, to be used by the Lord, isn't it? What a blessing to be used by the Lord. He, here's the other part of this, you know, guys. He, he can do everything that he does, everything that he has accomplished, he could have done without us, but he has chosen to use us, to let us be allowed, to give us the privilege to be part of his work. And we, can, we, we should consider that to be a privilege. I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep saying it until we get to the, to the right frame of mind because I don't think we're in the right frame of mind about this just yet. I said it a while back. If, if I could, I would call a business meeting right now and say we are going to do away with the nominate committee. It is not, that should be the last committee that's needed in the church. We shouldn't have to have it. We shouldn't need it. We shouldn't need a committee of people to call God's people to say, oh, please would you serve? Please would you sign up? Please would you be part of this group or would you do that? We should be standing in line to serve. To, to, I'm not talking about committees. I, I, I could care less. You could take every committee off of that, but I'm talking about to serve the Lord. Those things, so yeah, we're in committees. We have to do it to be organized and to and, and to be able to accomplish things and do it the right way, to be proficient at what we're doing, we have to organize it some way, so we have chosen to use committees to do that. And if your name's on that committee, then, then that's the responsibility that you have. And I hope you take that responsibility pretty seriously. And, and again, I wish we could just do away with the nominate committee altogether. And that folks would, would just, hey... Everybody in here would want to be on every committee there is. Now, I'm kind of stretching that out a little bit because, look, here's the thing. I just said that God gives us gifts to be used. Each of us have different gifts. Some of us have the same gift, but <clears throat> me and Benny might have the same gift to, to, to work on the fellowship hall committee. But Benny was called by God to do what God asked Benny to do. And I was called by the Lord to do what... God asked me to do on that committee. It's, a, it's special in that nobody else can do that thing that he's called you to do. What a blessing to be used. It is a blessing beyond compare to be chosen, gifted, and used by the Lord. And this list of officials that David in David's kingdom can teach us a, a few lessons, I think, this morning. So let's just jump in here and, and see what thoughts and ideas that God has for us this morning. Each person had a place of service. And uh, uh, no one can do the job that you've been especially designed to do. And that's what we were just talking about. No one can do the job that you're called to do. It may be on the same committee and it may be uh, the general same thing, but nobody can do the job that God called you to do. Matthew chapter 10 verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. Verse 30 says, But the very hairs of your head are numbered. And do not fear, therefore you are of more value than many 
sparrows. God knows each one of us. He knows each one of us by name, and He cares for each one of us, and He keeps up with His own, those that belong to Him. He knows who we are. He knows what we are. He knows what we can do. God puts us where we are. There's nobody that's actually here this morning that's here by accident. It's here by divine appointment. Everybody that is here this morning is here because that was God's plan. And you're here this morning because of that. We are to grow where He plants us, where He put us at. We're to grow there. And here's the thing. God will never plant you somewhere and leave you there to shrivel up and die. But when He plants you in a place, He will surely water you and grow you and strengthen you. And, and, and use you in a mighty way. Anywhere the Lord places you is a special place of service. It's not just any place. It's not an ordinary place, but it's a special place. He knows where He can best use your gifts for His glory and for the edification of the whole church, for the growing, the strengthening, the building of the whole church. Not just a part of it, but, but the whole thing. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Edifying, continuing, growing, moving forward, strengthening. So this morning I'd like to look at verse 28 specifically. And, and when we look at verse 28 in the scripture we read, we see a man by the name of Joash. And Joash was the, the keeper of the oil in this scripture. And uh, he, here's, a, here's a man who was uh, uh, in a place of uh, special service to the king. He was, he was asked by the king. He was assigned by the king to, to do this particular job. And uh, he, he has, a, he has a, it's, a, it's an important job, but... And, you know, it's, it's not a real high-profile kind of job, right? It's not a real flashy kind of job, right? It's, it's kind of, actually, it's kind of in the background. It's actually probably done. I, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I think history would kind of let us know that, that the keeping of the oil or, or whatever was stored probably in a, in a, in a low place, in like a cellar, uh, in, in a, and it was probably dark, and it probably had low ceilings and things like that. It was, it was probably damp if it was in the ground. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a very exciting job, but he, he served his king, and he, he did this in a, in a dark and damp and deserted kind of, kind of place, in a cellar. And you might wonder what you and I could learn from this passage this morning. Well, we can learn a lot about being in the service of the Lord, I think, this morning. You see, old Joash, he, he represents, I think, most of the church today. Uh, you know, there's only a handful I, that, that, that get to stand out in front. Uh, you know, I'm I'm so I'm so I'm so blessed uh, that I get to I get to be out in front. I, I get to be seen. I get to be heard. I, I I get to I get to share. Man, this this morning that was a great example. I got the privilege of being part of that. I got the privilege of being able to baptize her. But that was because of the work that the church did. First, the Holy Spirit, but the church. You guys, you guys are responsible for that in the background. You guys are going to be responsible. We're all going to be responsible for gathering around Lena and, and, and encouraging her. And, and, and we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that in a flashy way. It's, it's in the background. It might just be a hug or a handshake or a word of encouragement or whatever that might be. But it might not necessarily be out in front. A lot, of, a lot of the work that God calls His people to do are done in obscurity. Obscurity. I think about that word and, and I think about a piece of glass. You know, they, they put glass in, in doors and windows and it's called obscure glass. And you know, you can, you can see light through it. Light passes through it and you can see shadows through it. But you can't recognize who it is. You can't tell who is on the other side of that, but you know, you can see that there's something going on on the other side of that glass. But you can't tell the details of what that is. So often, most of the church, they work in that, in that shadow behind the scenes. Joash here, he is, he is, he is serving his, his uh, king. 
in the, in the cellar, tending the wine. And we can learn a lot about, we can learn a lot about old Joash, and we can learn a lot about our service. Joash, like many Christians, served the Lord in obscurity, yet his service, the service that Joash provided, was essential to the life of the, uh, 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 of the, of the kingdom and, and the growth of the kingdom and the strength of the kingdom. Just like us, the, your service and my service, our service together is essential for the life of the church. Well, this oil was an important item. It was an important thing in the Jewish society. It was, it was used for religious ceremonies. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 1 says, When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord... His offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. So oil was important. It was used in, in religious ceremonies. It was also used for fuel. Uh, Exodus chapter 27 and verse 20 says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Had it not been for that oil, the, the lamps would not have been able to burn. It wouldn't have been uh, light, or it would have been dark and light and dark and light. But but it was. It says continually there was light. It was an important thing. And then and then also this oil that Joash was uh, responsible for. It was it was a huge part of the business uh, world of the kingdom that day. It was it was part of commerce. First Kings chapter five verse eleven says, and Solomon gave Hiram. 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. He gave it to him year by year. It was used to do business. It was, it was commerce. It was traded. It was used. It, was, it, it kept things going. It was also used as medicine. It was an important commodity as medicine. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 34 it says, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Oil was used for cooking. It was used for cosmetics. It was extremely important. Oil is also, also it was used as a symbol, and it's a symbol today. And it represents the Holy Spirit. You know, we need, we need some people who will just have some good old, old-fashioned, who will keep, keep old-fashioned preaching and praying and praising the Lord alive in our day. Just like Joash. He, he, he may have had some times when, when he was not too excited about what he was doing, but I'm sure there were times when he was excited. And we need to be excited about the things that God's called us to do in that day. The keeper of the oil literally kept the lights on in Israel. Because if he hadn't a mind in that and took care of it and knew how much they had and and those kind of things, then, then, the, then, then the light surely would have went out because the oil would not have been in supply for them to be able to do that. The keeper of the oil in the church today literally keeps the lights on at the house of God. Are you willing to be a keeper of the oil this morning? Are you willing to do that? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Look, we need, to, we need to stay in place. Joash stayed in the place that God put him. You know, how, how many times have you been maybe at work or maybe here at church or, or, or just maybe some activity or something that was going on and, you know, you were, you were asked to, uh, uh, I don't know, you were asked to watch this particular door right here, right? All right, and there was, you know, and you stood there, you stood there and you watched the door but but it was but but everything was going on over here, so everybody was coming in this door, right? And man, all the conversations and the handshakes and the hugs and and all that stuff were going on over here. But but you were you were you were stuck over here, and you said, man, I I, I sure I, I I would much rather be over here at this door, so so that so that I can I can talk to folks and I can I can be part of all the excitement and stuff that's going on. You know, and, and it's easy. To, it's easy to get down, uh, but we have to stay. We have to stay in place. We must be. We must have been. Uh, we must have uh, 
It must have been hard for Joash to stay in that cellar, to stay there, while he could hear all of the, the commerce and commotion and things that were going on upstairs, right? And all of the doings of the house and, and all of the greeting of the people. But, but he stayed in place. If we want to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, we must be faithful to Him to serve Him where He has placed us. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. You know, when God asks us to do something for Him, you know, you know what, he's, what, what He's really saying is, I've got faith in you. I've got a job for you. I've got something I want you to do. Look, I wouldn't ask somebody else, but I'm asking you because I've got faith in you to do this thing, to do this task. That's what he's saying. He said, you have faith in me. You have faith in my son. And now I want you to know I have faith in you to do what I've asked you to do. You know, a lot of times it's easy to get to get uh, caught up in, in the things that of uh, 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 being called away. We need to stay until the king calls us. You know, our, our job is to be faithful. You know, Joash had to watch out for intruders also. And we have to watch out for intruders. Joash was to keep an eye on oil and be sure that none of it was stolen because it was an important commodity. It was an important item. <clears throat> and it could have easily been been been, uh, been stolen away in, in those days when a, when an army invaded another country and they came in that that was some of the things they would do they would destroy those storehouses they would steal those barrels they would load them up and haul them away they wouldn't allow them to stay there because they were important things we need some people who are wide awake today who have their eyes wide open ensuring that the oil of the spirit is not stolen by the thieves of complacency by the thieves of apathy and by worldliness and popularity. You see, there are those who want to steal our oil. And I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who would cause divisiveness, divisions, and put obstacles in the way of God's people, those who would, who would try to be contrary to God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Some would take our oil. They would steal our oil. They, would, they, wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even steal it. They would just want to, look, look, you got it. They, they would just want to come in and bust the barrel open and let it run out on the floor and be ruined and spoiled that no one would get benefit from it. Just turn it over and pour it out and, and watch it waste away. You know, it would be so easy to let our guard down. And, and that's, that happens when we, get, when we get lonely and we get discouraged. It's easy to let our guard down and, and to let that old devil come in and, 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 and tell us, hey, <laughs> look, you know that committee you're on. You know that job that you got. Look, don't worry about it. If y'all don't show up, if that committee never, ever meets, <laughs> nobody's ever going to know. Let's don't give Satan that satisfaction this morning to know that, to, 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 to lead us to that. Revelation chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2, it says, To the angel of the church, his sword is right. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now I know your deeds. I have a reputation, or you have a reputation, of being alive but are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. You know, it could be a thankless job. A job where you don't get a whole lot of recognition. It, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like that old light switch, right? You know? We walk up to that light switch and we flip it on. We never think, we, you know, we're so used to it, right? We, we, we walk up to the light switch and we flip it. And we just know when we do what's going to happen. The light's going to come on. You know, we treat a lot of people in our lives that way. We treat a lot of people in the church that way. 
You know, we just know that when we come into the church, it's going to be clean and nice and it smells good. And we know that, that everything's going to be in the right place. The Sunday school literature is going to be all passed out. The, the numbers on the board have been changed and the hymns are up here and, and the choir's going to be ready to sing. And we just, we take those things for granted. And, and every one of those things is blessings uh, for us. And they're all done by the body of Christ, people, individuals working uh, to, 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 to make it all go together. You know, how about those, and I, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, I got ahead of myself a little bit, but those, those and, and the people who get the recognition, so often, you know, in, time, in leadership, uh, we, leadership, leadership, we see the leadership of the church, we see uh, our deacons and, and, and those in leadership standing up and uh, they make announcements, They're, they have a more uh, 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 visual presence in the church, uh, because of, of, of leadership roles. And, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's kind of easy, you know, to, to, get, to get in that old kind of thing of, you know, well, let the deacons worry about that. Let them, let them deal with that. That's what they, you know, they, they, that's what their job is. That's what their thing is. Or, or, or that's just something that the deacons need to handle or whatever it might be. Or maybe it's that committee. Just let that committee handle it. But, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, whatever it is that you're called to do, whatever it is you've been asked to do, do it for the king. And he'll see the effort that, 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 you, that, uh, that, that you put into that. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. He sees what we do. He also sees what we don't do. He sees all of that. The cellar. The cellar for Joash. It was dark and damp and it was deserted. You know, all of God's assignments are not uh, pleasant assignments. They're not all cushy jobs. They're not all easy things. God calls to task, calls us to task, and He says, I have faith in you. Your obedience, even in a difficult place, shows that you have faith in God. We need to get over ourselves this morning. We need to get over ourselves this morning and realize who we are, what we are, and, and that we serve an almighty God. We need to get over ourselves and obey the Lord. To obey the Lord. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Deny themselves. You know, uh, do you remember back do you remember back when you were when you were a new believer? Do you remember when you stepped down into that baptism, that ba the baptistry? Do you remember that? I'll give you a few minutes. I know some of y'all have to think back a little bit farther than others. <laughs> but do you remember that? You were making a public testimony that day says that you were dying to sin. You were dying to self. And that you wanted to serve the Lord. We got a chance to witness that today. If you're here this morning, and you're, again, you're bought and saved by the blood of Jesus, and you followed through in Christian baptism, that's exactly what you said that day when you made those steps down into that baptistry. He said, I'm dying to sin and self, and I want to serve the Lord. You remember that was an old guy by the name of Nehemiah? Y'all remember him? God called him to do a great work. The nation of Israel was in shambles. And Nehemiah, he had, he had, he, he, he had come and, and, and he had rallied the people. They were in a time of revival in the nation of Israel, and they were building the walls back, but there was a group there that that constantly were trying to call Nehemiah down off of the wall because they knew if they could get him off of the wall, the work would stop, right? And they called him and they called him. They said, come down, Nehemiah. What did Nehemiah tell them? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not coming down because if I come down, the work will stop. This morning, that needs to be our pledge. Oh, no, I'm not coming down. I don't want to see the work stop. I don't want to see the work slow down. I want to see it speed up. I want to see God's work 
done in a great way. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21 says, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask you to, again, Lord, I, I hope you've already been speaking to our hearts. And Father, that you would just, Lord, that you would just draw us close to you. Father God, I know that there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, mention of salvation, Lord, specifically in this message this morning. Uh, but Lord, it, it was all over the place because, Lord God, uh, when you... Give us that gift of salvation. Lord, I also believe that you place in our heart a desire to, to want to work. So, Lord, uh, with, with that gift of salvation, Lord, it's a gift that has no strings. There's nothing attached to it. It's, it's free, and you pour it out on us if we'll just take it and accept it. And, and then, Lord God, when we do that, I believe that, Lord, we're going to want to go to work. We're going to want to be excited. Lord, just as we witnessed this morning, with Lena, Lord God. I know baptism is not a condition of salvation. But Lord, I believe when we get saved, we sure want to get baptized. And Father God, I got to see that in her eyes and in her heart this morning. Lord, a desire to want to follow you. Lord, to belong to you. Father, give us that kind of heart. Lord, that we'll want to belong to you. Lord, that we want to please you. That we want to we want to do our work for the glory of God, to glorify you. Father, I pray as, Lord, as we reflect on your scripture this morning and on, the, on your message this morning, Lord God, that we will uh, take uh, our places seriously where we've been called to serve. And Father, if there's a person here this morning who has, they're just, they, they said, well, just put my name down and Lord, they didn't really want to do that. Father, I pray that they would, they would call and say, you know, I, I, I really, I just said that to fill in the blank. And, uh, but you know what? I really, would like to, I really would like to work over here. And Father, that people would realize that you gave each of us responsibilities. You gave each of us gifts. And Father, you've given us each uh, things to do, Lord, that only we can do. And we can do them the way that you want them to be done. Father, I pray that you work and move in the people of your church. Father, that we might be a lighthouse. Lord, that we might shine bright to a lost and dying world. Lord, that folks would see that light. They'd be drawn to it, not because of anything that we do, Lord, but because they see you in that light. They see you in us and, in our, and you in our lives. And Father, that they would see that there's something different and they want to be part of that something different. Father, we ask now that you would just speak to our hearts. Lord, apply your word to our hearts, Lord, that we might go out and share it with the lost and dying world. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.